All right, welcome and thank you for joining us today for the Business and Community Alliance Series presentation, Mental Health Care in Our Community and Barriers and Solutions. This session will be recorded and we will share it with the attendees. It'll also be available on the Chamber's website. We are able to provide this offering to our members free of charge because of the generosity of our sponsor, Krauss Anderson Construction Company. I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker today, Timothy Weber. Timothy is the CEO of WebMed. Thank you for speaking for us today, Tim, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm pretty honored to be here to uh, present to everybody here. Um, I'm not a big fan of the Zoom conferences and whatnot. I don't know how many people are nowadays that we've been doing this for quite some time, but I'm gonna try to make this as interactive as possible and as um, unmundane as possible, especially on a Monday of uh, a talking head on your computer screen. Um, ideally, nobody really wants to look at my face for an hour um, just talking to you. So to begin, um, I'm gonna start this with kind of how I like to start a lot of my days, um, usually with a quick two to three minute centering exercise, so we can all kind of take a, take a break and uh, kind of take in Monday as it is, um, being that this is a mental health presentation, I think that this uh, kind of follows suit for where we go here. So I'm gonna have everybody close your eyes, give your best posture here. I invite you when you take your next breath to simply be more conscious. Allow your breath to bring you into the present moment, here and now. Breathe through your nose. Inhale cool air and nurture yourself. Exhale the warm air and expel any tension and negative emotions. Feel your feet connecting you to the floor. Gently correct your posture by slowly lifting your chin until the top of your head radiates up towards the sky. Relax your shoulders down like ice melting in a hot spring. And feel your neck grow long. Relax your forehead, relax your eyes, relax your jaw, relax your ears, and relax the muscles at the back of your neck. Take notice to your breath. Allow it to bring you to the present moment where you're safe, you're relaxed, and you're doing something positive for yourself on a Monday. Now start to quiet your mind. Let your thoughts go by like leaves floating down a mountain stream. Watch them as they come in and pass. Now bring your attention to your breath. Disengage from the past. Disengage from the future. Enjoy fully the present moment. Begin to cultivate an inner peace.
enjoy the safe place. Now take a slow, deep breath in and hold it for four seconds. Then exhale. You can begin to open your eyes. I want to say welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending. I'm going to get a screen share here. My goal is to get everybody kind of settled in on a Monday to take in Monday. As we all know, Mondays are, well, Mondays. So I'd like to present to you today the topic of starfish, nature's little hams. I'm gonna start with some starfish facts here. Um, starfish can live up to 35 years. There's about 2,000 different species of starfish. With some of them have like 40 arms. They don't have any brain. They don't have any blood. They use filtered seawater to pump their nutrients throughout their body. One thing that's kind of fascinating is they eat inside out. Their stomach actually leaves their mouth. They eat their food, digest it, and then their stomach comes back into their mouth after they're done consuming. After the starfish talk, we're gonna get into our mental health talk. Um, my name is Timothy Weber. I'm a family nurse practitioner, a mental health nurse practitioner. Um, I currently work at WebMed Mental Health in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, I was born and raised from the area, never left, can't ever leave, you love it here. Um, I went to uh, WITC. Uh, in Superior in 2009 and graduated with my RN degree. Uh, I went on to Walden University and graduated in 2015 uh, with a family nurse practitioner. And then I went back to school in 2018 for a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner certificate. Um, I had worked at uh, St. Luke's, St. Mary's, multiple facilities throughout the area. Um, as a family nurse practitioner, I'd worked at uh, the Cloquet Hospital. Um, I worked in the emergency room and as hospitalist. While working in the emergency room as a family nurse practitioner, I noticed a frequent and common trend with a lot of patients. That trend was people were coming in and out of that emergency room seeking mental health care. Our plan when we would have an, uh, somebody coming in for seeking mental health care, our goal would be to refer them out, get them into somewhere, get them in for an outpatient visit if it wasn't a crisis or an emergency. We hit a problem though. We would refer people out and the timeline would be four weeks, six weeks, four months, six months. So our emergency room started to become our primary mental health care. This was a major problem. While working there, I went back to school at Winona State University and finished that psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. And I decided I wanted to fill a gap. I wanted to fill the need where the mental health crisis, where the mental health issue was and it was really what I found while working in the front lines was access to care. I started WebMed Mental Health. I started as a hobby. Um, it was really a uh, couple hours a day, a couple days a week, just to provide a service for 
people coming in seeking mental health care, just somewhere for them to go to start some mental health services. This hobby turned into a three day a week to a four day a week to a 40 hour a week hobby. I had to figure out something else because the hobby was taking over my whole life really. So I got a team together uh, and we started growing our clinic. Um, to date, we have five psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners, two therapists, and we are continuing to grow. We've moved from Duluth or from Cloquet to Duluth. We have two locations and we have about 1500 patients after two years of operation. That to me is a major heads up of where we were at with our mental health in our area. 1500 patients within two years. Now getting into mental health, I wanna talk about what is mental health? A lot of people talk you know, let's let's discuss about mental health. Let's discuss what you know. Have this conversation, open conversations of mental health. What this is, mental health really is the state of our emotional well-being, our psychological well-being, and our social well-being. Mental health affects how we think, how we feel, and how we act. Symptoms are how we handle stressful situations, how we can relate to others and how we make choices in our everyday lives. Where do the changes in our own mental health come from? It's kind of a topic that a lot of people don't fully understand. Where does this come from? How does this happen? Biological factors can be a major player in the changes in mental health. Genetics has been found to be a major predisposition for anyone with a severe and persistent mental illness. It's been tracked down family lines and it's been pretty well documented how that works. Experiences. Our experiences shape who we are and what we are. The different things that we go through in our life can really have an altering effect on our mental health. We think of the traumas that some people endure, how those had a lasting effect to their mental health. Then also learned behaviors. Learned behaviors are something that we have found that has worked for us for some time. Then over time, it started to not work but it's what we know and what we're comfortable with. Taking a look at how impactful is mental health in our lives? Where is it at with our nation? So one in five Americans has a mental health condition. This is information from NAMI, as you can see. 12.8 uh, million adults live with a severe mental illness. So one in five Americans, they say it's like for every silver car on the road that you see is similar to the present, uh, prevalence of mental health throughout our communities. Now, physical health versus mental health. This is a kind of a hot topic on how we're looking at things. Characteristics of physical health is it's on a constant moving continuum. We go either from good to so-so to bad, and we kind of fluctuate in that area. You know, I stubbed my toe this morning and it hurt. So man, I'm kind of so-so, you know, that's physical health. Mental health is the exact same thing. You know, we go from good to so-so to poor. I was stressed about doing this presentation last night, so I was pretty anxious. I was pretty nervous, so I'm doing so-so before this. I'm still pretty anxious as I present today. Meh. That's kind of how, how that looks. The relation between physical and mental health are the exact same. Some problems are short-term, and some problems can be long-term. 
a lot of people will usually have good physical health. A lot of people usually have good mental health with some intermittent concerns or problems that they work through with assistance from their doctor. Pneumonia, strep throat, anxiety, depression. Some people may have serious physical health problems. And they have a negative impact on their life, like a stroke. Some people have serious mental health problems that have a negative impact on their life. So mental health versus mental illness. Before I go any further, I just wanna let people know if they have any questions, comments, anything, shoot in the chat. And well, I don't know where to find my chat, but put it in the chat. And I would love to discuss anything during this if you have any questions or anything. So uh, what's the difference between mental health and mental illness? Mental health, everyone has mental health. Just as everyone has physical health, everyone has it. There's no getting around it. It fluctuates. It's depending on genetics, experiences, and learned behaviors. Unmanaged mental health can have a negative impact on one's life and likely be or lead to a mental illness diagnosis. It's very similar to physical health. Diabetes, type two, poorly managed can get worse. Hypertension can be treated with initially, diet and exercise, if not treated with that, can get worse with medication, would require medication management and can get worse to coronary artery disease. Strep throat can move to a rheumatic heart disease, which is valve damage. Mental illness, Compared to mental health, is everyone will experience mental illness or difficult emotional control at some point in their life. If they don't, they're either non-human or likely to have a psychopathic personality disorder, which is a mental illness diagnosis. Mental illness can be short-term or managed well with treatment similar to physical illness, strep throat pneumonia. Mental illness can be long-term, SPMI, we'll hit that in a minute, and have long-term negative effects, similar to the physical illness, diabetes, cancer, stroke. So we talked about the difference between mental health and mental illness. Now we'll talk about the difference between mental illness and a severe and persistent mental illness. I think with our society, when we think of mental illness and discuss mental illness openly, a lot of people jump to the idea of a severe and persistent mental illness, which is very different between, from a mental illness. I threw a pretty common mental illness that most people are probably going through in these times. That's adjustment disorder. It's an emotional behavior reaction to a stressful event or change with marked distress or impairment in social or occupational functioning, lasting no more than six months after the stressor is terminated. COVID, COVID. So COVID has brought out likely an adjustment disorder and so many people on the effect that it has done to our nation, to our livelihood and to everything, to our daily lives. Another common mental illness, general anxiety disorder. This is excessive worry over 50% of the days of the week for at least six months with three or more of these of restlessness, fatigue, difficult concentration or mind going blank irritability, muscle tension, or sleep disturbance. These are common mental illness. These are common mental illness diagnoses. We look at severe and persistent mental illness. What is that? Severe and persistent mental illness is a diagnosis of a mental illness and 
two or more episodes, this is based on Minnesota guidelines, two or more episodes of inpatient care over the past 24 months, or continuous psychiatric hospitalization or residential treatment for over six months within the, within the past 12 months, so for over half the time over the past 12 months, treatment from a mental health crisis team two or more times over the past six months for this diagnosis, or a diagnosis of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, or borderline personality disorder with evidence of significant impairment in functioning. We can have a mental illness diagnosis and move through it is really the goal of this topic here. Many people, most people, coming back to this slide, everyone will experience some type of a mental illness or mental illness type symptoms throughout their life. Because we're humans and we're not the best at coping with things. It's just how we live, I'm sorry. It's just kind of how it goes. Tim, we had a question in the chat um, from Hannah Stevens, and she says, do other states offer a different definition of SPMI? You mentioned the definition provided is based on Minnesota criteria. Yeah, that's a super good question. Other states do offer um, other criteria. They're very, very similar. They're all very similar. There isn't anything that's any radical um, changes with any of them. Um, pop back over to that SPMI, here it is. Um, so I think some states may have like three or more episodes of inpatient care. Um, so it's, it's very minute changes with that. Um, but the this last one, the diagnosis of schizophrenia, bipolar, major depression, or borderline personality with evidence of significant impairment in functioning, that one is pretty much blanketed for the most part. That's a super good question. So we're gonna get into our barriers. We're gonna get into our solutions. When doing this is kind of looking at the different barriers nationally, then looking at the different barriers locally. So it's kind of two different trends to look at. I tried to kind of uh, intermingle them both for the most part. So this is a little ad from NAMI. It's the common barriers of treatment. They include the cost of mental health care and insurance, prejudice, discrimination, and structural barriers like transportation. Barriers to mental health. Let's talk about some of these. Cost. So 8.9% of adults in Duluth do not have any kind of health insurance coverage. Sorry, I had to cough. I didn't want to cough in everyone's ears. Late or not. Oh. Um, <clears throat> so 8.9% of the adults in Duluth don't have any type of insurance coverage. That is a major barrier to care. How are they gonna get treatment? Wisconsin Medicare versus Minnesota Medicare. For many of the clinics in our area, somebody that has Wisconsin Medicare cannot be seen at the, at the clinic. Um, Wisconsin Medicare or Wisconsin clinics, um, there's not too many in Superior, there's not too many in the area as far as outpatient uh, chemical dependency outpatient mental health treatment. It's very few, very far between, and it's created kind of a problem. So um, a Minnesota clinic needs to be located within Wisconsin, have a physical address within Wisconsin for them to fully accept Wisconsin Medicare. Another one is people with mental illness are less likely to have health insurance than those without mental health problems. That was found on a recent study from well, 2010. Recent is relative, right? So lack of mental health professionals. 
this is a major problem. This is a major problem. This is a major problem for access of care. You know, this is when we're working in the ER and we're looking at scheduling somebody six months out for a, an initial med management appointment for mental health. So med management providers um, are psychiatrists, psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. I'm sorry, I didn't add them in. Um, so there's a major shortage nationally, not just locally. So this is a major problem and kind of really growing um, or really festering the, the main problem of the lack of access. It's difficult to recruit. It's difficult to recruit to this area. I mean, un unless if you've lived here and you love the winter, Florida looks nice. Uh, it does, not a lot. So recruitment to the area is difficult based on weather, location, and whatnot. There's a lot of waiting lists, waiting lists for care, waiting lists to get in, waiting lists if you miss an appointment. If you miss an appointment, you then popped on a waiting list to get back in. And then rural areas and the underserved communities. Um, I think it was last year, two years ago, there was an article in the Duluth News Tribune of International Falls, a psychiatrist had retired and there wasn't any other psychiatrist or med management provider within 100 miles of International Falls, which created a major problem. Along with rural areas, we can also look at our family members and our community members that are living in skilled nursing facilities. Um, how we're getting the treatment to those people um, if they need it, if so warranted. Getting back into barriers, unmanaged symptoms. It's a common, common indication of an unmanaged mental health is having a difficult time attending scheduled appointments. Kind of touched on that a little bit ago. Many times, if somebody misses so many appointments, they'll either be discharged or put on a waiting list to, to be able to continue services. While their symptoms are, I have a hard time managing and getting to my appointments. Unmanaged symptoms creates the difficulty in maintaining and participating in relationships, often leading to isolation. Not the social isolation, of COVID, but isolation, I don't wanna be around anybody isolation. And since COVID, our crisis response team in our area has been taking phone calls only right now, which has had a, an effect on the emergency rooms um, within the area. Another major barrier is stigma. Let's save the, uh, in my opinion, the most important barrier to care for last. Stigma comes in different ways. It comes with personal stigma, how I feel about myself with a mental health diagnosis. It comes with social stigma, how I feel about other people with a mental health diagnosis. It's driven by ignorance and it's killed with education. It's very, very difficult for people to accept what they don't understand. It's very difficult for people to accept what mental health is, what a mental illness is, what a severe and persistent mental illness is, if they don't understand what this is. It leads to judgment and shame. It also leads to discrimination and disadvantages throughout life. The effects of stigma, it promotes shame, it promotes fear, and it promotes silence. These are things that we don't wanna be promoting to anybody. We don't wanna be promoting these to ourselves and we don't wanna promote these to our neighbors. This is what stigma does for people. It creates self-doubt and one's ability to actually overcome a mental illness. 
like if I were to create self-doubt that I'm going to overcome stubbing my toe today. Reluctance to seek assistance. I stubbed my toe three weeks ago and I still can't walk on my foot. You should probably see a doctor, right? No, I'm fine. Ignore it. Don't talk about it. Don't discuss it. I'm fine. I can't walk, stub my toe, probably broke my foot. I'm fine. Everything's fine. That's the reluctance to seek assistance. It also creates people seeking help through Google instead of trained professionals. Dr. Google is a terrible answer to any medical, any physical, any mental, any health concern. If you Google anything, you're probably dying. It's a good chance. Um, they found that 90% of 14 to 20 year olds experiencing signs of depression are researching it, over talking about it. It creates delayed and refused mental health management. It does stigma. We kind of hit on self stigma. What is that? What does that look like? Shame, fear, refuse to acknowledge the problem. I'm walking fine, I'm just hopping. I can hop great. Social stigma. Social stigma is, like I said, driven by improper education and fear. It creates disapproval, discrimination to other people. People, it'll create people not to wanna to be around other people creates decreased opportunities in the workplace, friendships, families, can also lead to bullying, violence, or harassment. The effects of delayed and refused mental health management. All right. Number one, worsening mental health status. Kind of hit on diabetic type two diabetes. Worsening symptoms, if we don't treat that, can lead to diabetic ketoacidosis, highly fatal condition. Again, relinking how mental health is the exact same as physical health. And create an increased negative impact in our lives with increasing negative consequences. Can lead to an inpatient hospitalization or acquire some type of crisis stabilization can lead to homelessness and ultimately death by suicide or overdose. That's what stigma leads to. So if we think stigma is a problem, we're probably right. We're probably right. How we view ourselves needs to change. Here's another slide about uh, some information from Minnesota. One out of every eight emergency department visits involves a mental health or substance use condition. I found that pretty interesting. Tim, we have a, yeah. another question, if that's, a, that's okay, from Hannah Stevens. Absolutely. Again. Um, she asks if, do you see reluctance to seek care more prevalent in certain generation generations, such as baby boomers versus Gen Z? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, absolutely. There's, uh, you know, for Minnesota, the, the stoic Minnesotan um, typically middle-aged adult males have a hard time um, from my experience um, opening up and seeking care, discussing their mental health, um, even acknowledging that they have mental health, let alone discussing or talking about it. That seems to be one of the, for me, um, the more difficult populations to really connect with, to really um, 
have these open and honest conversations to have them kind of review their thought process of what mental health is um, as stigma has been held pretty tightly. Therefore, delaying care, therefore, refusing care. That was a good question. Anybody else have any other questions? Throw them at me. Just throw them at me. Sorry. There's none of um, this, this time right yet, but I, I'm going to keep monitoring them. All right. Perfect. Um, See, so yeah, I thought the one out of eight emergency visits was pretty interesting. Um, it is a mental health diagnosis or a substance use diagnosis. Um, and another one that I thought really was really interesting is the only four out of 10 people in Minnesota with a mental health condition receive any type of treatment in, within the past year. These are alarming. These are alarming things to look at. One American dies by suicide every 12 minutes. Veterans, 20.4 deaths by suicide per 100,000. And Minnesota, 16.9 deaths per 100,000. These are problems. Starfish break. So let's talk about starfish. Um, starfish have no brain, as we talked about. Or no, I'm sorry, they have no heart and they have no blood. We talked about this. So they need ocean water to survive. The ocean water really acts as their, their blood and they pump their nutrients throughout their body with filtered ocean water. I thought it was kind of interesting. I like starfish if you haven't noticed, sorry. I think they're kind of fun. Um, the other thing is thousands of starfish can be washed ashore during low tide and they're out there and they need ocean water, but these little babies aren't in the ocean water. So they're gonna have a hard time with no blood, no heart. They need that ocean water. So if this is most recently June, 2020 in Myrtle Beach, this picture, you can see thousands and thousands for miles of starfish getting washed up. I love it. How's everyone doing? I'm doing all right. We have another question. Yeah. Um, from Chris Johnson. She said, maybe your presentation will touch on this as we continue, but do you have any recommendations for encouraging someone um, you know to seek mental health support or treatment? Yeah, we'll hit that in a little bit. Absolutely. Great, thank you. I'm gonna make a note to make sure that we do. Just kidding, I don't have a pen on me, sorry. Make a mental note. All right, solutions to barriers. We went over the barriers. Um, barrier, one of the barriers is cost. So how do we change this? How do we make this available? Open the accessibility to allow this, the financial barrier to be taken away. We look at sliding scale fees. We look at flexible payment, pan, payment plans. Um, opening up the acceptance to the different insurances. Um, and Minnesota opened up uh, Minsure Navigators to help people get enrolled with insurance. As we know, 8.9% of people in Duluth don't have insurance. So Minsure Navigators can help people get enrolled, set up and in with a plan for insurance so they can be covered and move forward with their physical and mental health care. Um, insurance has significantly improved significantly improved as far as coverage for mental health since the Affordable Care Act. If you look at any um, articles that had come out prior to the Affordable Care Act, it's, uh, it's alarming um, how many people had no coverage. Um, I remember reading one article of Minnesota's mental health coverage for insurance and the quote was, it's terrible. You know, it was like the, the headline from the Duluth News Tribune. Minnesota healthcare coverage, comma, it's terrible. Wow. So um, the Affordable Care Act did amazing things for opening up the care, opening up the coverage for care um, within Minnesota, within our country, 
really. So that's not really a local specific issue. Um, another barrier, lack of mental health pro professionals. How do we move over that barrier? Minnesota has opened up psychiatric or really all nurse practitioners. They've allowed nurse practitioners to practice independently. Um, this has been very important to open up access to physical and mental health care. What that means is a nurse practitioner does not need to have a physician co-signing a note or co-seeing a patient for the management of that care. Um, as long as they, there are some guidelines for a nurse practitioner to be able to do that, they can't just walk out of school and be like, oh, we're good to go. Um, recruitment. How do we recruit? How do we get people to come over here? How do we get people from driving an hour away to work somewhere else when they live in Duluth? You know, that's up to a recruitment department within our facilities to figure that one out. Um, telehealth. Telehealth was wonderful in the past prior to COVID. Opened up care for a lot of people. The only problem was for telehealth, we couldn't have um, evaluation management visits. Uh, we couldn't have um, visits from a provider with these from a patient's home. They had to be from another location, a satellite location, certain satellite originating sites allowed from, from Medicare. Since COVID, they opened up the originating site location to be able to be in a patient's home. This opened up care to everywhere. This took away that location barrier, that rural community barrier that's International Falls. It took that barrier away for people to be able to get mental health services. This has been a huge silver lining of COVID um, for, P for the access to care to open up based on location wise. Unmanaged symptoms, what are we doing? We kind of discussed on you know, what unmanaged symptoms look like and how that affects and it creates a barrier for people to continue to be able to access their care. So some clinics have offer walk-in availability for clients that have a hard time making appointments. They set up certain times um, throughout the day of a walk-in time where somebody that has had a hard time with a scheduled appointment knows that they can walk in that clinic anytime at that time, well not any time, any any day at that certain time of the day, and get a point and receive an appointment and have an appointment and help with their management of their mental health. Um, I know that we started that pretty initially, pretty quick, um, and it's worked really well. We do walk-in appointments at four o'clock every day with any one of our providers. Um, opens up for walk-in appointments for new patients and walk-in appointments for um, established patients that have a hard time making their appointments. Um, we have emergency rooms. People can go to emergency rooms seeking care, getting help, um, and kind of get that, that process going for the, the start of the management of their mental health. We have the crisis residential treatment, um, which is in our area, Birch Tree. They do a fantastic job um, of getting people in a safe spot while in crisis, get them out of their crisis area, have them in a safe spot, monitored, start managing some medications, and then start building their team for follow-up. So how they can manage their life after they leave there so they can move on with their life and not have to stay there. Um, then crisis response teams do wonderful, wonderful work. Um, they're worth their weight in gold and crisis respond. Um, crisis response employees do fantastic work. It's a 24 seven, uh, seven days a week. Well, I guess that would be the seven 24 seven, wouldn't it? Um, service that if somebody's in a crisis, usually they would come out to that person and assess and refer either if they need to go to an inpatient hospital, if they need to go to a crisis residential, or if they need to get set up with increased services, uh, they would go to that patient. It's an amazing service that Minnesota has set up. Solutions for stigma. 
normalizing mental health discussions, openly discussing our own mental health status and our own mental health treatment, our own shortfalls, where we're not doing great at. I was anxious as heck last night. I stayed up like three in the morning because I was nervous. Educational opportunities, continuing to discuss having these talks, having these discussions with our um, in our community. The Make It Okay campaign does amazing work also with employers um, getting different, uh, doing different events at different businesses and getting people to discuss mental health to kind of cut down some of that stigma, cut down the social stigma, cut down the self stigma. Community involvement, that's kind of what that Make It Okay. And then peer support having conversations with people that may be struggling, that you think are struggling, that you know are struggling, having honest, real conversations. Our goal looking forward, ideally, the goal would be for us to change our view of the mental health and have it mirror physical health. We have a yearly physical checkup with our physician. We want people to seek assistance with the maintenance and want mental health care before they're in need of mental health care. We seek to achieve this by providing skills, resources, and techniques to provide or for people to adequately and appropriately manage their own mental health, whether they're seeking preventative mental health care, treatments, skills, or in need of assistance today. Our goal is prevention and moving forward with that. I got some mental health data for Duluth from 2016. Um, this is presented from the Community Health Needs Assessment for 2020-2022. Suicide rates increased by 5.4% since 2011 to 2016 to 11.8 per 100,000. There was no major change in males, but there was a significant increase in females. 24.6 adults reported having depression compared to the Minnesota state value of 18.6. This is significantly increasing since COVID. It's gone to 48%. 48%. Every other person every other person in this meeting, every other person in our office, every other person in our homes reported having anxiety symptoms or depression symptoms in January, 2021. We talk about how COVID has affected our mental health. It's affected our physical health. We're well aware of that. But what has this done to protect our physical health? What has this done to our mental health? 10.6 of adults reported their mental health has not been good for 14 or more days in the past 30 days. These numbers for our kids is alarming for me. I have a, a ninth grader next year and 13.9 uh, ninth graders reported seriously considering suicide compared to the Minnesota State Valley of 11.8. 13.9. Holy smokes. 33% of adults in Duluth report binge drinking. One out of every three 11th graders use e-cigarettes and 23% of eighth graders believe there's no health risk with smoking. What can we do for stigma? Kind of touched on it a bit ago and we're gonna talk a little more about it. 
what can we do for stigma? Okay, um, talk openly about mental health. Have open, honest conversations. Share on social media if you're having symptoms. Talk about it. You know, how many times do we see people take pictures of their broken leg and put it on Facebook? They're pretty open and honest to share about their, their physical concerns. Just as if we were to ask everybody, you know, who here has been to the doctor in the past year? Who here has seen a psychiatrist or a therapist within the last year? hands would likely go down because our own view of ourselves and the stigma that goes with it. A major one is respond to negative comments and misconceptions with facts or personal experiences. This can have a major, major change in people's views, people's attitudes, and nothing kills a stigmatized joke than responding with, I went to Hazleton inpatient treatment. I was that guy. That kills a joke if somebody's talking about addiction and how people struggle and they're trying to make fun of them. That kills a joke. Encourage equality by drawing comparisons to mental health and physical health. Educate people, talk to them about, you know, there's really no difference between mental health and physical health. You know, it's the continuum coming and going. Some people have cancer, some people have schizophrenia. It's just life. Another one is show compassion for those with se severe and persistent mental illness just as you would for somebody with a cancer diagnosis or a physical diagnosis that has majorly altered their life. Be honest and open about treatment. The more we normalize treatment for mental health, the less power stigma has on us and the people around us. It's choosing empowerment over shame. We reduce stigma with open and honest conversation about our own shortcomings. What we can do to improve our mental health. We can value ourselves, take care of our bodies, surround ourselves with good people that care about us. Give yourself, this means give yourself, give time, um, give your time to other people spend time with people, um, help other people, volunteer, do things in your community. Learn stress management techniques. These can be Googled. They can be, but learning how to use them isn't a Googleable thing. It is not a Googleable thing at all. Learning how to actually utilize techniques is, can be difficult. Quiet your mind. We just did a quieting mind exercise as we started today. Setting realistic goals, not focusing on the end result, but focusing on the process. Break up monotony, do things different, change things up here and there. Avoid alcohol and other drugs. I've never met anybody that has alcohol use disorder or any substance use disorder that wanted to have a substance use disorder ever. Nobody woke up one day and be like, I would love to be an alcoholic today. Nobody asked Santa Claus when they're 12, Santa, let me be an alcoholic. That is a learned behavior as we hit on already, as it worked really well and I want it to continue working, but the consequences are getting worse. Get help when you need it. Don't be afraid to get the help. Get help before you need it. Learn how to prevent mental health from having negative drastic consequences in our lives. So at WebMed, we, uh, whatever, sorry. Um, those are the things that we can do to improve ourselves. We've talked about how to reduce our stigma, how to improve our own mental health. There was a question that I didn't write down and it was, 
I'll find it here too. Sorry. No, it's okay. All right. It was, do you have any um, recommendations for encouraging someone, you know, to seek help for mental health support or treatment? Oh, yes. Um, one of the best recommendations you can do is discuss, have open discussions with them, ask them real honest questions, um, and actually have a meaningful conversation. Show your interest in them. Let them know that you want to talk to them. Suggestion does wonders. Telling somebody they have to do something doesn't work that well for a lot of people. I know it doesn't work for me. I'm not gonna do something if I'm told I have to. But if it's suggested enough times, I might pick that up. I just might. Another thing is, it's stressful. It's very stressful. Um, having a loved one, having somebody that you care about that's struggling with mental health and refusing to get treatment. Another aspect you can bring up is your own mental health. Talk about your mental health and what you do for treatment. If you work with a therapist, if you take a medication, Talk to them about what it was like, where you were at, what brought you to that point. And talk to them about what your life is like now. Having that conversation is very important for people because that provides hope. That reduces stigma and it provides hope for them. Thank you. That was some great tips there. Um, we have one other question, um, and it says, what are some tips you can provide HR professionals and managers who notice an employee could use access to mental health professionals given the HIPAA restrictions? Absolutely. Um, I would uh, look at having policy procedure made, a certain person designated as a mental health um, kind of liaison somebody that people can um, that can kind of screen, monitor, and move forward. Um, employee assistance programs do fantastic work. Um, handing somebody an employee assistance program brochure is something that changed my life. It really did um, for my employer handing that to me. It's something that actually works. Um, and having that within your facility is one of the best things that we can do for that. Um, another thing is just having somebody that is having open, open conversations. Um, maybe if it's a designated person, you know, that professional uh, boundary is somewhere that can be hard to navigate. But um, if you have a designated person that is there to have those open discussions, um, that may be, be able to open up the conversation further. So it's 12.58. Are there any other questions? No. I guess I'd just like to close with a, a little story quick here. Uh, we kind of talked about starfishes throughout this presentation, how they get washed up on low tide at Myrtle Beach. Plus one day this little boy was picking up the starfishes and throwing them back. Just there for hours. This old man looked at him and kind of giggled. He walked over to him and said, Hey little dude, what are you doing? The little boy said, the sun's up and the tide's going out. If I don't throw them in, they're gonna die. The old man looked at him and said, you realize there's miles and miles of beach and there's starfish all along it? You cannot possibly make a difference in this. Little boy looked at him, looked down, picked up another starfish and threw him in the water. He looked back at the man and said, it made a difference for that one. 
So we don't need to make a change that's gonna affect everyone. But if we can make small changes affecting even one person in our life, that's making a difference. We have an opportunity to do this. We have an opportunity to change the way we view things, change the way we talk about things, change the way we view ourselves, change the way we view others. We need to move forward with that opportunity. I say thank you to everybody for listening. Oh, well, what a way to end that. <laughs> yeah, it got me. Um, thank you so much for presenting for us today. And uh, as I said in the beginning, this is recorded, so we will have a link for that. And then if Tim, if you have any backup materials or anything that you would like me to include in the email, feel free to send them over and, and your contact information if you're okay with that as well. Um, and this concludes our program. Again, thank you, Tim. That was a really eye-opening presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody that stayed on and listened. Bye-bye.